Mastering Fear Harness Emotion to Achieve Excellence in Work, Health, and Relationships by Robert Marr, Ph.D. with Michelle Gifford, M.A. Narrated by Sean Renette Introduction The Laws of Success The success of humanity hinges on learning the laws of nature. Buckminster Fuller we all strive for success. We work hard to achieve competence, recognition, and rewards in our work. We dream of finding the perfect mate and feeling the joy of giving and receiving love. We endeavor to eat right, exercise, and maintain good physical health. Yet for many of us, the success we yearn for remains elusive, and maintaining success seems impossible. Why do some people seem to have such a hard time succeeding in the three key areas of life, work, health, and relationships? And why do certain people achieve success only to destroy the very accomplishments they've worked so hard to attain? These are questions I have struggled with for many years in my work as a business consultant and a clinical psychologist. I've wondered why some very disciplined, successful people persistently fight weight gain, smoking, alcohol, and drugs. Why individuals who desire romantic bliss repeatedly choose partners unsuitable for commitment and intimacy. And why stress disorders, which underlie so many other challenges, seem to be getting worse, despite all of the research and experts out there to help. Consider these all-too-familiar scenarios. A hard-working, dedicated employee is promoted to a leadership position. He has trouble delegating and becomes increasingly ineffective, difficult to get along with, and aloof. A romantic relationship begins with great optimism and excitement. Then one partner becomes steadily more critical and distant, and finally disappears. An individual achieves a dramatic improvement in health, changing lifelong patterns of drinking, smoking, or overeating. Then a stressful event occurs, and she or he resumes the habits so painstakingly changed. Each person was devastated as their dreams slipped away. As a professional working to help people at all stages and in all walks of life, situations like these confounded me for years, and I wanted to know why. It seemed pointless to be helping people pursue and accomplish their life goals if I could not also help them master the skills necessary to sustain them once achieved. But where would I look for the answers? Fortunately, the answers came looking for me. For most of my career to that point, I'd been doing what psychologists typically do. I worked with people who were struggling with some aspect of their lives, identifying the specific problems they faced, and helping them to overcome those difficulties. This approach forever changed when I walked through the UCLA Medical School library one day and saw, sitting on a table, the book Plagues and Peoples by William McNeil. The cover intrigued me, so I sat down and began to read. From that moment on, my professional life would never be the same. The book described how the whole course of human history has been radically influenced by diseases such as smallpox, malaria, and yellow fever. What fascinated me most, however, was not the illnesses themselves, nor even the devastation they caused. Instead, I was captivated by how these plagues were cured. Prior to my visit to the library that day, I had assumed, as perhaps you do, that the way we remedy disease is by studying people who are ill and, from there, brilliant researchers in top-notch laboratories develop the miracle drugs needed for a cure. This is not, however, how the majority of these horrible maladies were tamed. Take smallpox, for instance. This great killer had been around for thousands of years, taking the lives of an estimated 500 million people. Yet the cure for this dreaded illness was not discovered through scientific experiments on the disease itself. Instead, it came about when someone began looking closely at who wasn't getting sick and then tried to figure out why. Figure out why. In the midst of the smallpox epidemic in 18th century Britain, a country physician named Edward Jenner became intrigued by a common folktale claiming that milkmaids who had previously been sickened by cowpox would never get smallpox. 
Without knowing how the immune system works, Dr. Jenner developed a bold, creative experiment. He injected an eight-year-old boy first with the cowpox virus, then with a very small dose of smallpox. The boy developed resistance to the deadly disease, and the use of this vaccination was thought to have saved more lives than any other invention in history. Studying those who have stayed healthy in the presence of grave illness and discovering what was different about them has pointed the way to success in curing other diseases as well. Building the Panama Canal was perilous work, primarily due to the mosquito-borne infectious disease, malaria. Many lives were spared, however, when an inquisitive physician by the name of Dr. William Crawford Gorgas began asking himself why the sailors aboard ships never became ill, whereas the people digging on land were so tragically susceptible. The difference, he cleverly surmised, was that the mosquitoes were drawn to the still water near the canal, whereas the sailors were steadily surrounded by ocean currents. Preventing this illness, he discovered, could be achieved by replicating the environment of those who stayed well. As I read these accounts, I began to reflect on my own profession. Historically, the field of psychology had focused primarily on seeking accurate diagnoses, labels for people's problems, then designing effective treatments from there. After reading Plagues and Peoples, I began to believe that more significant breakthroughs could be made not by observing those courageously struggling, but by looking at those who were succeeding and discovering what they were doing differently. I concluded that if psychology was to be most useful, our work should be focused on determining how successful people thrive. We should be replicating the conditions of those who are well. With these thoughts in mind, I began searching worldwide for studies attempting to identify the laws of success, those skills necessary for people to succeed in all key areas of life, work, health, and relationships. Although I found many published books on success, I was discouraged to find that a vast majority focused on only one aspect of life, career success or relationship success or physical well-being. However, as I persisted in my research, I discovered many long-term studies that had followed large groups of people for years that attempted to discover what circumstances and skills are necessary to overcome adversity and sustain excellence across time. Among these investigations were the Kuai Longitudinal Study, the Terman Study of the Gifted, the Harvard Grant Study, and the Study of Adult Development, Gluex Study. There is, of course, no straight line to success, and no one can achieve and hold on to success without some setbacks along the way. However, each of these investigations contributed meaningful insights regarding the fundamental principles or the laws of success. The Kuai Longitudinal Study followed 698 infants born on the island in 1955. They were followed from the time they were in the womb through the next 40 years. The Hawaiian Islands are a researcher's paradise, as many inhabitants live on the same island and utilize the same limited social, health, and educational resources throughout their lifetime, which makes tracking information across time relatively easy. As the study progressed, the principal investigator, Dr. Emmy Werner, began to take a special interest in a particular subset of this population. These were high-risk children who, despite exposure to stress during pregnancy, premature birth, discordant and impoverished home lives, and uneducated alcoholic and or mentally disturbed parents, went on to develop healthy personalities, stable careers, and strong interpersonal relationships. One out of three of these high-risk children grew into competent young adults who loved well, worked well, and played well. None developed serious learning or behavioral problems in childhood or adolescence. Dr. Werner and her team studied this group to identify the protective factors that contributed to the resilience of these children. The term and study of the gifted followed 1,528 children in California schools who were labeled gifted both by teachers and as a result of intelligence tests. These children were born between 1900 and 1925, were predominantly white, and most were from middle- and upper-class families, a population born with every advantage. The study began in the 1920s, and some individuals are still...